So this panel that we're going to talk about today is about ocean protection, um, something obviously near and dear to all of our um, hearts here in Laguna Beach. What I want everyone to do is take a breath, one breath, big breath. Okay, now take one more. That second breath was produced by the ocean. It produces half the oxygen on the planet that we breathe. So whether you're lucky enough to live right here in Laguna Beach or you live in the middle of the country, uh, every one of us cares about the ocean. And um, you know, t we're, we're in a special place here in Laguna Beach. We have one of the most spectacular coastlines in, in California, these rocky reefs and these kelp beds. And uh, I have had the good fortune to spend uh, most of my 50 years in, in Laguna Beach, and when I was a lifeguard in the 80s, snorkeling and fishing off the reefs in Laguna Beach, they were, they were largely dead. You'd go out there, you wouldn't see a lot of fish. Um, there were urchin barrens, which means that the urchins had kind of taken over, so it was just purple everywhere. Uh, very few kelp beds. And um, the lifeguards, the older lifeguards, when I talked to them, I'd say, "Why? where are the fish? Abalone, four deep on the rocks. The, they said it was fished out. You should have been here yesterday. And that was just kind of what we accepted as fate. And uh, what was happening here in Laguna Beach in the 80s is kind of an example of what's been happening all over the world as we sort of overfish our oceans. You fast forward to today, and we have this marine reserve off the coast, which was highly controversial, and it's night and day. It is now teeming with fish. Uh, my kids, who grew up in town, grew up with a healthier ocean than I did. And it's remarkable. It's still controversial. There's a lot of fishermen who still want to get out there and fish, no question. But it's really hopeful. And as Jeremy said, the solutions are out there. Uh, and this is one of them. So what I want to do today is have this esteemed group of folks here talk a little bit about ocean protection and what that means. And uh, Sarah Badolf was supposed to be on this panel. And unfortunately, she was ill. So we're going to miss her from Oceana. But we, we got the legend himself, Greg McGilvery, yeah. who, uh, who's, who's made an incredible number of really important films about the health and importance of the ocean and conservation. But um, quickly, I'll, I'll introduce our panelists. We have, you know, this guy doesn't need an introduction, Greg, Greg McGilvery. Greg Long, uh, big wave professional surfer, conservationist, uh, long time supporter of the Surfrider Foundation, and a real champion for our oceans. Uh, and then John Baker, a, a new friend with an organization called Wild Aid, which is a global wildlife protection organization. Um, by the way, congratulations. Yesterday, today, yesterday, depending on the time zone, uh, Wild Day just won uh, something called the Earthshot Prize. A big deal. <laughs> and they won that for um, their marine protection program. So maybe we'll start with you and tell us a little bit about that prize and the work you do and why you won. Sure. Thank you. And uh, it's an honor to be here. And uh, there's so many, uh, you know, legends and people who are so inspirational. And uh, Wild Aid, just to sort of zoom to a different scope for a second, is, as um, Chad mentioned, international in scope. You don't know our name much because we work mostly in other parts of the world. We're based in San Francisco. And um, we originally were focusing on ending the illegal wildlife trade. And 20 years ago, this was one of our main focus was ending the consumption of shark fin soup. And uh, that is something you don't do here. We do it in China and Hong Kong and Taiwan and those places. And uh, I won't tell that story. I will say that um, our campaigns that we've been running um, on shark fin soup in particular, with people like Yao Ming and Jackie Chan, et cetera, in China, have had huge impact. And now there's 80% reduction in consumption of shark fin soup. <laughs> However, at the same time we were doing that, uh, we were getting calls from people in different parts of the world where there were rampant illegal shark finning operations going on to supply this demand. And one of the places and where the story started was in the Galapagos. So even if you go now or you read about the Galapagos now, it's a world-class national park. It's a marine reserve. It's truly world-class. 
It wasn't that way 20 years ago. 20 years ago, they hardly had a boat. They had an old um, Navy, retired Navy ship that spent most of its time in maintenance. It was slow. And they had no way to you know, stop these illegal fishermen who were killing tens of thousands of sharks. So we're going to come back to the marine reserve here and the, what you saw here, because we've seen the same in the Galapagos. Anyway, it's been a long journey of many different steps along the way, which has resulted now in, like I said, a world-class national park. And if you go there or you go see the rangers that we have equipped over these years and trained and watch them monitor and surveil this massive reserve using all kinds of satellite and all other forms of technology that are integrated to a single platform, you see a ring around the reserve, which is the boundary, but you see that's where all the fishing boats are. Fishing boats are sitting right on the edge. And so first, it's a success story because the fishing boats know where the boundary is. Second, we've equipped them now with a, a response mechanism, a bunch of faster boats with the radars and other technology. So you can pinpoint the enfor enforcement actions. So the boats don't come in because they know they're going to get busted. And um, the reason the boats are there is because there's a lot of fish. Um, and now the, the kind of piece de resistance is that the Galapagos now is the densest shark population in the whole world. So it went from being the hot spot of shark finning to now being the most densely populated shark concentration. So anyway, um, that's sort of the first step we took that was a long journey, but along the way the government of Ecuador asked us to take our approach to 18 coastal reserves along their continental coastline, which then led to us going to Indonesia, which then led to um, a bunch of different places, Palau, I mean we're in over 18 countries now, and it's not really about the numbers, but it's about how we're responding to a need. And the need is that there are s over 40,000 marine reserves in the whole world, but only 60% of them, I mean, actually less, 60% of them don't have any kind of enforcement. They don't have any, they're just lines on a map. There's no boat, there's no pa patrolling, there's no rangers. And we're not about police action. I mean, we're about like uh, enforcing the laws and getting the fishermen and the communities and everyone involved in understanding why we have to protect it and giving them ways to have maintain their livelihoods while at the same time, you know, restoring these marine resources. Um, so we bring a unique approach and there wasn't a lot of international attention to marine protection per se when we started the journey. Um, there was obviously a lot of attention on terrestrial uh, protected areas. So um, the Earthshot Prize, Prince William, it's a, you know, it's a big deal and thank you for a shout out. And um, you know, we, we never get these things. We're like this unsung hero. Uh, we're working in China, no one knows what we're doing. If you go to China, which no one's done, right? Because they've been closed down for the last three years with the pandemic, they just reopened. I've already been on two trips there already this year. But if you were ever to visit, um, while you've never seen the Wild Aid logo around the U.S., you get out off your plane from your gate to the taxi, you'll probably see 20 of our billboards. Um, we're running huge and massive campaigns. Um, and uh, so while we're working hard to protect uh, we're now in 95 protected areas and I think I said 16 countries, including some African countries, including Gabon, which Wes has visited and has, and we're thankful for his support actually to that program, but um, there's obviously a lot more work to do. So the prize is about recognizing an impactful solution that can be scaled. So they give you money to help you move forward and connect you with donors. And, it's not enough. I mean, we need more. So I don't, the other thing is people say, oh, you just got a million dollar award. You don't need my money. It's like, yeah, we do. Because <laughs> 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 the, the, the issue is just so big. And the other thing about it is that it's all about partnership. So we heard a lot already. Like, 
we have to work together. Like, we can't do this on our own. We never, it, our whole model is based on partnering with others. And that really becomes a, a, key, a key aspect. I know I could talk about this for a long time, so I'm gonna like, <laughs> cut it off here. And happy to field any more specific questions um, that, um, and whatever you wanna hear about. Yeah, thanks so much for the, all the good work and, uh, and congrats. Uh, just to take a quick step back too, there's sort of marine protector is a broad term. Uh, we have little, uh, very protective marine reserves like the one off Laguna. We have larger uh, national marine sanctuaries that allow fishing and limit other things like oil drilling. So there's a whole spectrum of these things out there. And you know, the ocean covers 70% of the surface of the earth, but somewhere between three to 7% of it's protected. So a very, very small amount. Um, and as I alluded to, when the Laguna Reserve was set up, it was highly controversial, right? Because we're asking these fishermen not to fish at these places that they, they love to fish. And the most valuable habitat is also typically the best fishing, so that's the rub. Um, I grew up fishing, still eat fish, still fish, still f spear fish. Um, Greg, I know you, uh, in, in your world of uh, watermen, that's also true. So maybe you can kind of share your perspective, A, on ocean health based on your world travels and sort of, you know, how you talk about this tension between, uh, you know, protecting marine life and also consuming it responsibly. Yeah, it's um, a tough stance to take, uh, especially being guilty of uh, an extreme amount of travel in my younger years. So it's always, um, you know, people are quick to come out and point out your faults. Uh, and I think we're all guilty of them in some form or another in our own lives. But uh, as Jeremy talked to you earlier, let's not get caught up with perfection, but rather progress. So it's this, for me, been a constant evolution of surrounding myself with people who are far smarter, you know, such as yourselves, who have dedicated your lives to studying this, the scientists, researchers uh, who are out there leading you know, the education and learning from them. And how can I adopt you know, what they're saying, what they're sharing? and teaching us into my own life. And though I know I have a lot of you know, room for growth and I always will, um, it is that you know, personal devotion to just continually being better and finding the spaces where I can both change personally and then hopefully influence that positive change. But it's always very you know, controversial and, and it always will be. Um, and especially when it comes to marine protected areas, uh, this is one that yeah, I learned um, firsthand, you know, when we announced the 30 by 30 campaign, uh, out of the woodworks, social media, in person, every avenue, friends who are, you know, commercial fishermen and even just recreational com fishermen, you know, really combatively coming at you, you know, verbally and even, you know, borderline physical altercations because they were that heated over the thought of their you know, resource for their livelihood, understandable even for their recreation, potentially being taken away from them. And unfortunately, a lot of them, not all of them, but uh, weren't able to come back down to a level where you could have rational dialogue. And sadly, I feel like that's what one of our greatest challenges you know, across the board in politics um, and even just, you know, having a different thought, ideas of, you know, religious beliefs or, or otherwise, the inability to come down and have, you know, constructive dialogue and learn from each other. Um, Jeremy did an incredible job of that in the film Purple Mountains of actually going, you know, into the lion's den. Uh, but with, you know, that open you know, expression of I'm here to learn and see where is the common ground and, you know, what do we share? And oftentimes I think we find there's more in common. It's just obviously our you know backgrounds, upbringings, you know passions, hobbies, you know livelihoods, but there is common ground. I think in the end, when we all slow ourselves down, this is the conversations that I did have surrounding those. Um, you know, we all see the dire state that the ocean is in, the urgency for the protection, conservation. You know, far beyond that which we're even proposing, um, and you know the ultimate future, you know, should we not act upon this? And it's just hard to get people to change. You know, that's one of the you know, biggest challenges I think we could probably all admit in our lives. You know, we are creatures of habit. We love, you know, once we're settled into our routines, you know, changing our ways. Um, unfortunately, we're at a time where, you know, everybody, I think when we slow ourselves down and get out of this, you know, me, 
I, you know, this is my world, I don't want things interrupted, you know, there needs to be an unprecedented amount of change and we're all gonna need to sacrifice something at some point. But having that conversation, and I learned a lot from you know, talking to my friends who are you know, recreational fishermen. They're like, well, why are you even you know, thinking about this area where you know, this is the spot that we remember you know, having a far greater abundance and it has the rock reef structure that's gonna support the type of regeneration. And so, yeah, there's so much to be learned you know, across the aisle in those conversations. So finding, you know, those platforms where you can have that and bringing people into the fold and, and collaboratively working together. Um, so it, it's a tough thing to do, um, but, you know, otherwise you're just going to continually have this combative, you know, forms of conversation where, where nothing ever gets done um, other than, you know, more separation. Um, and in the end, it's going to take every individual coming together. You know, we've got here collectively as one human family, um, and we're going to need to start behaving like one and working like one together to get back in the direction we need to be going. Here, here. Greg, Greg mentioned something 30, called 30 by 30, and this is sort of a big global goal to protect 30% of the land and water on the planet by 2030. And uh, that's science driven. And the goal there is both to protect sort of the biodiversity crisis that we're in, protect the wildlife, but almost more importantly, at least selfishly, it's to allow nature to regulate the climate on the planet, um, which it did for billions of years before we started pumping carbon into the atmosphere. So uh, th this is a big idea uh, and controversial because we got to pick those that 30% that we're going to limit uses in. So, um, Greg, you, you started making uh, surf films, I'm not sure exactly how long ago, maybe 50 years ago. When um, I was 14. Yeah, 14, so longer <laughs> ago than that. Uh, and you, you probably have, you know, maybe, uh, I grew up with Jacques Cousteau, who, you know, influenced my thinking about the world and the oceans. Aside from him, you might have influenced more people about the beauty and importance of the ocean than anybody else. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about your journey from surf films to IMAX and kind of what you've learned along the way about ocean protection. Well, I've learned that it's a never-ending fight. Um, you know, you end up, thankfully, with a lot of good things happening today. And one of them is 30 by 30, but um, also you have the Inflation Reduction Act, which uh, is, is huge in relationship to addressing climate change and uh, reducing carbon emissions. Um, I'm hopeful, I have always been hopeful, but I always know that you have to use science and tell people through good communications that comes through education and entertainment. And we utilize the IMAX documentary um, to get out to kids and to ad adults uh, in 250 theaters around the world, 70, 70, 70 countries. Um, Every year we release an IMAX film, and uh, in fact, this year's film, we're, we're showing a rough cut of it on Sunday at three o'clock. It's all about uh, designing the city of the future, but a city that will be carbon neutral, um, developing its own energy through clean sources. And the kind of acceptance of this is becoming more pronounced. Um, and what we found is that the young people of the world, um, not just in America, but elsewhere, are conscious about the impacts of, of climate shift and are addressing it. Um, it's kind of like the, the Disney once told me how to get to the adult to spend money on a project. Use the nag factor with the kid. Get the kid to nag the dad or the mom to go out and buy something. And that's what is happening today. The, the kids are actually carrying the message to the home. You know, you gotta buy this project or this product which doesn't have plastic in it. You gotta do, you know, these things that reduce, you know, buy an electric car, that kind of thing. And uh, so I look at it, um, as something that we're at the beginning stages of being more aware, 
through science, and we're getting reports every year about how we can shift our activities. But also, um, I'm hopeful because there is good communication. Um, now, I am representing Oceana here, because I'm representing, I'm supposed to be Sarah Badolf, <laughs> who for two years was my assistant in our office, and I love this young lady. She now has her environmental degree and works for Oceana in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, she got sick, so I have to tell a little bit about Oceana, because I know she would. And Oceana, as, as we well as your have, project, is, yeah. are doing great job in limiting fishing practices around the world in a very responsible and efficient way. The utilizing the money that they've been able to raise, and maybe they're in seven or eight countries, including in a major way in the US and in Canada. And you end up seeing results driven through communication, driven through legislation. And once, you know, even with the fishermen, they're getting fishermen in a room and saying, you know, do you want to catch the last fish like you did with the sardines or the cod? and just wipe out an industry and everyone doesn't have a job? Or do you want to have a nursery like we have offshore here in a line that goes three miles out and then three and a half miles this way and three and a half miles this way? And you have more fish, like Chad said, than we've ever seen in our lifetimes. Um, hundreds of times more fish, um, including the lobster and the abalone are coming back. And it's a wonderful success story. And it'll be evaluated, our MPA off here, um, in about four years at a 10-year mark. And everything will be counted. Again, the, the fishermen will be brought in. And there'll be uh, adjustments made. But um, it's the way to do it. And I think that there's hope in, in the world today um, as long as we all get together. Now, you, you mentioned 30 by 30. And you have to understand that that was a presidential initiative. And even though California has adopted that as law, other states have not. Um, if we don't vote properly in the next election, um, and Mr. Trump gets in, the first thing that he will do is cancel that program. Absolutely, because that's what he did the first time. He got rid of all of the presidential edicts that uh, were done by Obama. And you know, you end up can't doing that and making progress. It's bad for our economy, bad for our jobs, and bad for us as human beings if we reduce, uh, if we don't reduce the amount of carbon that we put in the air. And so um, you need people like Biden in, in, in the presidency to actually make a difference. Um, it's a tough road. It's a very controversial road. Um, but he's brave to do it, and he did it. Thanks, Greg. Vote the mountains, vote the ocean, vote the planet. I'm going to try to get us back on, on track time-wise a little bit. So we're going to do a little speed round. <laughs> These are uh, big problems. Uh, and uh, each of us is one person. So if there's this, your, this audience is here to learn about ocean protection, if there's one thing they could do to make a difference, what would that be? We'll go down the line. I would say, um, well, it has to be only be one thing. I would say sustainable seafood. Sustainable seafood choices. A lot of good guides out there. Monterey Bay has one aquarium. Greg? Education. Continue to educate yourself and use the sphere of influence that you have in your life, whether it's immediate family or you know, if you're an athlete, a little bit bigger or whomever else, and you know, continue to share what you are learning and be open to learn from other people. And you know, with that, you know, following the guidance of those who, again, are at the forefront have dedicated their lives to finding these solutions. And um, so yeah, sharing that education you know, in the direction that uh, we should be going. I love that in this in this pol in this sort of polarized world, most people trust their friends. So you can have a lot of influence by talking to your friends. Greg. Well, I think we you have to come back to marine protected areas. Um, 
uh, we, we started making films about that about 12 years ago. And it, it was a fresh idea back then, and it was an experimental idea that all the scientists were in, in agreement that it was going to work. Um, and so we featured a ecotourism resort in, in West Papua, Indonesia, where this husband and wife couple had said, well, we're depleting the reefs of every fish there is to eat for our families, but we're reducing the number of tourists will come here now because you cannot put a mask and snorkel on and have a good time. He says, let's get all of the natives and all the, the, the population, all the fishermen together and say, we will give you a job at our resort if we all maintain a marine protected area here. And they, they had a buy-in, took three or four years to develop this area, and then about four or five years to develop the resort. It's now the number one resort in that part of the world. It's a huge success. You go there and you dive, and you see fish that you hadn't seen in 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 maybe a thousand miles. Now Indonesia, the West Papua province, is is designated as the first conservation province of the 30 provinces throughout Indonesia. And it's striking, the success story there. And just to add, that was the project that Wild Aid helped with when I said Yay. we went to Indonesia. Yeah. Same place. We all got to work together on these problems, no question. Um, with that, why don't we turn it over to questions out there, and we'll see if there's any questions for the audience. Yeah. What is sustainable? Seafood and you know, in terms of where you get it, you know, what does it mean? I mean, some people would say sustainable seafood is no seafood. So that's one side of the spectrum. Um, we have a, a large planet with a lot of people. I work a lot in China, and China is the biggest seafood consuming nation in the planet. You probably also could guess they have the largest fishing fleet. So we got a baby steps to start with, but it does start with science. And you said there's a bunch of different guides. Like, I go crazy trying to figure out what guide is really the accurate assessment and what's really like sustainable or not. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and um, uh, there are some obvious things that we shouldn't be doing. Like, we should not be eating like farmed shrimp from places that are mostly not sustainable in our de destroyed mangrove, never to be restored. There's some, some easy ones there, but it does <clears throat> require a lot more studying, getting to your point. Um, but to leave it, you know, to everyone to become an expert on it, that's not going to help much, you know. And I have so many experiences with people who, you know, are so educated and have been exposed to all the messaging, just even here in California. And still, you know, you're appalled to see what they order at the restaurant, you know. But you know, the Monterey Bay Seafood Guide is probably yeah. the best for us here. Yeah. And you can get an app on your phone, mm -hmm. and you can go into a restaurant and it sort figure out where the fish is caught. You can ask the chef. Um, you know, th there are places like Santa Monica Seafood that do offer sustainable product. Um, you can go to a restaurant, like my wife embarrasses me by all the time, and where she goes, I want to talk to the chef. I want to find out if this is a sustainable seafood. And, you know, you, but, but you, uh, the underlying thing, and, and generally they're put on the spot, and a lot of, I guess, two or three places have shifted just on Barbara's nagging. <laughs> they've shifted their policy, and they've changed where they buy seafood. Um, that's what you want to see, activism. Don't be afraid to step out there. Thank you, Barbara, for doing that. <laughs> but the, the cool thing is, though, is, is once you get them engaged, the owner of the restaurant is going to go, oh, I'm going to lose customers if I don't do this. And then they become conscious about what they do serve. Um, in terms of buying fish, though, you can pretty much cross off 
uh, orange roughy, um, Patagonia toothfish, which is Chilean sea bass. Even though it tastes great, it's pretty much not sustainable. Um, you want to find fish stocks that aren't next to being completely gone. Uh, <laughs> And it, like swordfish goes up and down, um, sometimes you don't want to catch and, and eat swordfish. Um, I don't know what the condition is right now. Now I think it's probably okay. But the uh, um, anyway, there, there's it's complicated, but um, you can you can manage it. Hello, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I'm a senior at LCAD, uh, and my question for you guys all is, in your work, um, a lot of these sacred places that we're talking about, you know, the ocean, the forest, um, do you ever look to indigenous knowledge, first people knowledge, uh, about these problems? Uh, because they did have a lot of the solutions to these um, current problems that we have now, so I'm just curious about if you've done any research with tribal nations. Um, or anything like that. I'm going to give you an incredible stat that kind of tells you everything you need to know, which is that indigenous communities on the planet control about 5% of the land left on the planet. That's how much we've sort of erased them. Those 5% contain 80% of the biodiversity on Earth. So the indigenous communities are the only ones on the planet that have actually maintained the biodiversity. We've done a terrible job. Uh, so we have a long way to go to learn from those folks, um, particularly in the United States. But uh, it's better in some other parts of the world. But the, uh, the answer is not enough. We need to do more. And uh, we have a lot to learn from them. We'll just add to that. Sorry. Just really quickly, uh, it's a sign of hope. I mean, it gave me huge hope. But recently, a few weeks ago, the Ecuador had an election. And there was a, 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 a referendum on the election that had to do with whether or not they were going to allow petroleum development in an indigenous um, zone of the country. And it was a national vote. The entire country voted to support the indigenous people, which was an amazing, amazing outcome. The, on the flip side, there was a similar vote in Australia just even more recently, two weeks ago, where the indigenous community of Australia was asking just this idea of having a voice. They were just asking to have a referendum to so they could have a voice, not even give them anything, land or money or anything, just a voice. And that didn't pass. So back to the divided theme. I just want to get back to the, um, the, the fishing piece of it and also it, maybe that could be solved with either branding or, or storytelling around the quality of the fish or where it was caught, you know, being able to be sustainably sourced as a positive uh, value proposition like prime or grass fed, you know, having, you know, I don't know if, the, if it's the, pr the provider, providers or like the actual chefs p baking that into the fish that, so as consumers, we see value in that, we actually s search that out. Is anyone doing that? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I'm sure there are. Yeah. Uh, I live in Sausalito. We have a local restaurant called Fish. They serve only sustainable. On their menu, they put the name of the boat that the fish came off of. There's a, there's, in, in California, there's some uh, CSA type fishing, so you can actually get fish straight from the fishermen. So like the community supported agriculture, there's community supported fisheries. It's a little bit more expensive because it should be. <laughs> They're not strip mining the ocean to get it. But the, so there's some good options out there. I, yeah, I wanted to um, ask another question about the marine parks. I think um, the the one thing I like about the Marine Park Initiative is that it's letting nature do nature. You know, it's letting nature recover the way nature only nature can. I think, and I'm a long time offshore fisherman, and in the in the fishing communities, the 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 marine park issue becomes a very black and white issue. And John, you're probably a good person to talk to this. I think it's interesting for the audience to understand that like marine parks are very nuanced. I mean, there's lots of areas where commercial fishing might be banned or gill netting might be banned, but local fishermen or sardine fishermen can still fish or recreational fishermen can still fish. Can you talk a little bit about the nuance and diversity of the marine park issue? Because I think it's important for people to understand that. 
Yes, definitely. Thanks for asking that. For sure, um, the idea of a marine protected area is just a label, a word, and they are all different. And there are even res you know other um, reserves that are not even quote unquote protected areas that also have some controls and. Um, I like to tell this story um, from Mexico, a place, Scorpion Reef in Yucatan, where we work. I, I was astounded to hear the guy, the head of the fishing cooperative who we work with there, tell the story of the fact that the, you know, the whole, um, it's a protected area, but they allow, it's a lobster fishery there. So you get the permit. They give you a number of permits that is a, a so, so supposedly a sustainable quota. So that's a fishing principle that, you know, w we, has been lost in the tuna fishery, right? Because the idea of a quota, they just go with whatever the the commercial interests want to approve. But if you can get these locally based reserves where, you know, the idea is to maintain the, the um, livelihoods of the communities, but in a way that this will be a, restore, a restorable resource. So the, um, the fishing authority in Mexico, their boat engine failed. So their boat couldn't go out. And the fishermen got in an outrage, which to me was like, wait, that's counterintuitive. Like, you'd think the fishermen would be happy. Like, the police ranger guy is not out here. But they, it was havoc. So the, fish, the fishing cooperative got an engine for the government's boat so they could be out there. And that's what it's, that's what's really, you know, it, and again, to Wes's point, it's th none of these reserves, they all have very specific regulations to address the specific situation that they're in. There, I mean, there may be places where it's fished out and you shouldn't fish a single fish, or there may be places where a certain species is allowed or a season or a area that, you know, so it's, there's all kinds of um, permutations that, but it has to be designed to address the threat that has been assessed scientifically. I would add to, like, we're, we're lumping fishing together, like all fishing is not equal, right? So there's bottom trawling that's incredibly destructive and kills a bunch of stuff. There's catch and release recreational sport fishing that's incredibly sustainable and like a spectrum in between. So the trick is, like you said, is to manage to the threat and you try to allow as much sort of other fishing as we can. Got a question over here? Yeah. Hey guys, it's Obi, Obi Kaufman. Yeah, right on. Right, on. I'm looking forward to talking with you, Chad, up at Proof Lab. Yes. Yeah, we're gonna do that on Giving Tuesday. Surf Rider and Fish, John. We gotta go have Proof Lab. Uh, yeah, we gotta go have some dinner at Fish. Fish is one of the <laughs> best yeah. restaurants You're in invited. California. You're invited. November twenty eighth. <laughs> Absolutely. And I appreciate the the the, uh, the focus on biodiversity talk here on your panel. Uh, I wonder uh, if we could take a moment to talk about. Uh, uh, Petroleum exploitation, uh, a lot, especially along California's coast. We have, we just ended the public input period for the uh, newly designated, or to be newly designated, Ch uh, Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary along the Santa Barbara Channel, uh, which should keep the the, the derricks out, uh, or or or. Uh, you know what? What? What will be the future of those crystal ships on the horizon? Is Surfrider working at, uh, on that at all, or, or what? Would you guys know? Yeah. So you know, there's repeated efforts. The Trump administration tried to open up all. This is back to Greg's point. All coasts of the United States to offshore drilling. Mm -hmm. There was a. We had a huge campaign against that, which we were successful in stopping. So we didn't add anything new. The Biden administration right now is actually talking about opening up, despite promising not to open up any areas, areas in Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico, which we're opposing. Um, and you know, the the rigs in California. Were, most of them were put in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So almost all those things out there are 40 years old. Three years ago, October, uh, one of them spilled and caused problems here and on Huntington Beach and Newport Beach. So there's still a mess. It's crazy. There's 24 rigs out there. Some are inside state waters, which is three miles. Some are beyond that, which is federal waters so that controls who, who's in charge. I've been in meetings. The oil companies said, we can't afford to take them out. Uh, you, they can't be taken out. It'll cost too much money. It's impossible. We need to leave them there. Um, when they put them in 40, 50 years ago, guess what they said? Oh, we can take them out, no problem. 
Sure, let us put them in. We promise we'll take them out. So it's a classic case of you know them getting the front end benefit and us getting stuck with the costs. So there's been bills in California, I won't bore you with the details, but there's a lot of complexity, mostly around the long-term liability of the existing rigs. Probably the most viable thing to do, which is also controversial, is something called rigs to reefs. Cap them, cut them off about 100 feet below the surface, and let them sit there as an artificial reef. Um, there's actually a, a Senate bill that Dave Min, who's our local state senator, put forth to do that. It failed, it's coming back next year. So uh, something to work on to get those rigs off our coast that are a uh, liability for oil spills. Yeah. Awesome, last question. Any, anyone, any more questions? So. As a senior at Laguna Beach High School and a member of the Amazing Flow Club, I gotta ask if you guys have like one specific opinion or pointer for us as like kind of the future of sustainability, especially as me as like wanting to be a sustainability major. Like what's one thing you think us as the youth should be doing if it's just like a small thing every single day or like what, what's the most important thing do you think we should shoot for if we want to get interested in sustainability and? Do you want to answer that, Greg? I think one important thing you should keep in mind as you move into that field is to find something that you're not only passionate about, but you can also have fun doing, that there's some crossover into it. Um, from a lot of friends who've you know, immersed themselves in that world, you know, they've reached a point where I see, I mean, they're head down, they're doing it, but the importance that through all of this, we're also meant to be having a lot of fun and enjoying ourselves as well. So finding whatever it is that you can have that deep meaning and purpose, but also you know, still having the time where you're immersed in the ocean, surfing, diving, whatever it may be, and that will continue to sort of be the fuel that keeps you going down that path and, and inspired. Because without it, I see a lot of friends um, starting to burn out and get frustrated and losing the joy that uh, we're ultimately meant to be having uh, simultaneously as we're doing this. So uh, that would be uh, one suggestion. <laughs> Conservation can be fun. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Any other? I'm going to insert one extra question if I could. Just um, see of Cortez, where do things stand right now? I know, you know, for a few years with depleting stocks, I'm just kind of always following that as a, as a, a child, just spending so much time in Sea of Cortez. Anyone can? I'm no expert. I, I can give a couple of data points, but I know a couple of Pulmo, if you've heard of it. I mean, it's a huge success story, so hopefully that can be something that is an inspiration and a, and a model to be replicated. I mean, obviously, you've heard the story of the Vaquita and the Totoaba and that whole thing, which hopefully we never have to repeat that. I don't know. I We don't have time to go into it, but that's something I hope it's is a story that will people will pay attention to as something we should never get there again. All right, thank you. So uh, if you would, uh, how about a round of applause for an incredible panel, a steam panel. After lunch, uh, the talks continue, so stay close.